So thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Corman, and I have the privilege of being the Executive Director of your UIC Alumni Association. Welcome to the UIC Alumni Exchange Series. Through the UIC Alumni Exchange Series, we work to bring our alumni and friends a variety of programs and topics so you can explore, connect, and even escape from the everyday with a community of UIC alumni staff, faculty, and alumni experts. You'll hear me say this a few times today, but I encourage you to visit go.uic.edu slash alumni exchange for the latest and greatest programming. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today as we tackle the unfortunately timely and difficult topic of gun violence and public safety in the United States. We are joined by seasoned public safety expert, UIC School of Public Health alumnus, Terry Williams. Terry will walk us through the prevalence of gun violence, its traumatic effects on communities and the role of public health in addressing it and offer action-based approaches and solutions. Thank you so much, Sherry, for being with us today and I'll turn it over to you to begin the program. Thank you, Karen. Give me one second. All right. I appreciate the introduction. Um, before I begin, I would like everyone to join me in conducting a breathing exercise I, want, I would like everyone to take three breaths. Inhale, exhale with me, uh, starting with the first breath. The first breath, I need everyone to breathe in with me. While you're taking that breath, I need you to think about the victims of gun violence who's impacted. On the second breath, Think about the families who are, who are impacted by gun violence. And then lastly, on that third breath, I need you to think about the advocates and the workers who are out there putting in the work when it, as it relates to gun violence. So I do this exercise because when you think about mindfulness and you know, taking care of ourselves mentally, um, this is a very heavy topic, and we need to address these heavy topics. That's why we are conducting this presentation today. Um, but I am not taking a political approach to this. I need everyone to be open-minded and think about some action-based solutions as we go through this presentation. So today, we're going to be talking about what's the definition of mass shooting. We hear that a lot in the media. We hear it a lot in our literature. Uh, we are talk about the prevalence of gun violence, not only in Chicago, but uh, just on the national level. Then we're gonna go through the effects and levels of trauma uh, from gun violence. Um, because I'm public health, I'm in public health, we're gonna, we have to look at the lens of uh, public health. And then we're gonna look at some action-based approaches. Um, and finally, uh, in this presentation with some uh, solutions, uh, suggested solutions and, and a dialogue. Now, a little bit of background about myself. I've been in law enforcement and public safety for the past 16 years. Uh, I've been personally impacted by gun violence um, with family members, uh, uh, including a cousin that I lost some years back uh, to gun violence. Uh, I have family members uh, who indirectly has, have dealt with gun violence. Um, being born and raised here in Chicago within the greater Inglewood community, uh, unfortunately, communities like Inglewood has suffered from uh, gun violence incidents. Uh, so having that lived experience is very important to me. Um, also on a professional level, uh, responding to gun violence incidents, in which we are talking about throughout this presentation, uh, it has an impact. I see the impact not only on myself, but I see the impact on uh, my colleagues. I see the impact on these families. I see the impact um, on victims who may not have uh, passed from a gun violence incident, but the injuries that, that occur from these incidents. So we got to first define what is gun violence um, or firearm violence. So the CDC um, looks at uh, gun violence as firearm violence, but they're synonymous. Uh, for the purpose of this um, presentation, we're going to talk about gun violence. And a firearm injury is a gunshot wound or penetrating injury from a weapon that's used by a powder charge uh, to fire a projectile. Uh, weapons that use a powder charge include handguns, rifles, and shotguns. Now, I want to put a caveat in, into this presentation as well. It's kind of a disclosure. If you are triggered by the content 
that we discussed today, please log off. Uh, this can be an impactful uh, experience, uh, just talking through these things. Uh, so I, I would like everyone uh, to recognize that and recognize everyone that's on the line. Uh, they may or may not have had um, incidents or uh, direct impact when it comes to gun violence. So with that said, I just kind of want to get a feel for the room. I'm going to take a quick poll. And can we launch the poll, please? Have you ever been directly, have you ever had a direct experience with gun violence? This can be something as simply as witnessing it, being a victim, knowing someone that's a victim, your family member. How are we looking on poll, Karen? Yeah, we have it. It's about 47% yes and 53% have not. Okay. And, and that's, that's really important to think about. So 47 of uh, the population on this line has direct experience. Uh, that's why I did that breathing exercise and, and gave that disclaimer because um, it is a heavy topic and it could trigger uh, some of your lived experiences. So uh, God bless you that uh, if you have been directly in influenced and impacted by gun violence, but uh, for, the, for those who have not, um, we're not immune to it. No one's immune to these incidents, as you can see, and which we'll talk about in this presentation. So I don't want to go uh, too deep into it right now, but uh, just looking at this poll, uh, it's very important uh, to con conceptualize uh, what's going on. Here we go. All right, so let, that brings us to why we all here today to talk about these mass shootings. What is a mass shooting? So the National Center of Analysis of Violent Crime, they provide a close definition of the term mass murder, right? And mass murder is defined as three or more, okay? I need you to keep that in mind. Three or more uh, incidents that's occurring within that same time frame. There's no distinct, distinctive uh, time period between the murders, all right? Um, so President Obama, uh, after the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, which we probably all remember, he defined mass killings um, through laws, you know, the Investigative Assistance for Violent Crime Act uh, in 2012. They defined the phrase of three or more killings during an incident. That's excluding the death of the perpetrator. So at number three or more is considered a mass shooting. Right, we've seen that a lot in our media coverage, and you're like, okay, are we really having that many mass shootings? According to these definitions, yes, we are. We're all impacted by these mass shootings. On a professional note, back in 2008, I actually responded to NIU. I used to work at NIU Police Department um, during this incident, and I can tell you firsthand that this experience impacted the entire community. And not only imp impacted the community, it impacted uh, the officers, the fire department, the teachers, the staff, the students, uh, everyone was impacted by this incident. We just recently had an incident in Texas that kind of prompted this conversation. And then just recently on the 4th of July, God bless those victims, um, we had our mass shooting in Highland Park, right here in Illinois. So just looking at the numbers, there have been at least 309 mass shootings in the U.S. in 2020. This is not over an extended time period. In 2022, uh, I said 2020, but in 2022, um, according to the Gun Violence Archive, uh, since June 8th, we had over 27 shootings within schools. So they've been tracking these uh, stats since 2018. Um, I just mentioned back in NIU, um, we had this incident back in 2008, all right? So we're not immune to this, these issues. Just um, some feedback. Back in 2008, before the Valentine's Day shooting at, at uh, NIU, mass shooting wasn't really talked about. It really wasn't researched as much as it, as it is now. Um, if you remember, we had Virginia Tech, um, around that era, uh, we had the Calabine shooting um, around that era. And um, then we had NIU. 
And then the conversation started, started to begin. Uh, actually, Virginia uh, Tech University, they, they published a lot of articles uh, after, after action reports uh, that led to some really robust research around mass shootings, particularly in higher education, uh, which we'll talk about um, later on. So let's localize it a little bit more. Um, here in Chicago, you see, again, you see it in, uh, in the media, mass shootings here in Chicago. Um, and Chicago alone, compared to other major cities like Philadelphia, New York, Baltimore, we have surpassed it tremendously, 811. And this is tracking us uh, from 2018 uh, to 2020. If you look at just uh, shooting incidents alone, a homicide due to uh, gun violence, Back in 2021, we had 801 deaths from uh, firearm related injuries here in Chicago, okay? Back in 2020, we had 774 incidents, all right? And now we know the, what the definitions of mass shootings are. Now you see why we, why we publicize this in, in Chicago media, because it's very important. Um, can you say we have a problem? Um, that's why we're looking at things on a public health, uh, in a public health lens, because this is an epidemic. You know, we've all experienced pandemics. Uh, we uh, here in with, with COVID, uh, but the epidemic is is localized. It's right here in Chicago, right in front of our faces. So we're not immune uh, to these incidents. Let's localize it a little bit more. Uh, thinking about um, our Chicago neighborhoods, so firearm in injuries. Uh, they've either wounded or killed over 60,000 people in the U.S. each year. And most of these um, incidents occur within the African-American and Hispanic communities. Now, I, wanna, uh, I want you guys to understand something. The direct and indirect effects from gun violence, now they're, they're felt by both the people that's involved, but the entire community, the entire neighborhood, they have chronic and persistent gun violence uh, issues, okay? If you don't believe me, if you don't believe these statistics, I'll tell you what the CDC says. So if you look at the top of my screen, the top leading causes of death here in the US between 15 and 24 is homicide, okay? That's very important. That's the number one cause of death between 15 and 24 black males here in the US uh, is homicide. And these have chronic effects. I want, I want us to focus on these chronic effects of trauma. As they get older, looking at the 45 to 54, 55 to 64, then we start to have heart disease. These physical effects from the trauma, the second leading cause of death in the US amongst black males, they start early between one and 14 is homicide. These are 2020 statistics, just last year, or two years ago, excuse me. And then you start to get in, as they get older, start having uh, issues with cancer. They're having a physical effect within these communities. And the reason why um, we're focusing on Chicago alone, because we do a lot of research here in Chicago, we're having a, a epidemic you know, issues, but we can use Chicago as a model to look at other, other platforms, other cities who have um, the same root cause issues, systemic issues, uh, systematic issues. So on the public health side of things, we I'm have sorry, to- Oh, I'm sorry, Jerry. Can I just break in really quickly and ask you a quick clarifying question? Sure. Somebody had asked us, or had asked you, um, when you were talking about the number of people that uh, defines a mass shooting, um, the person said, was it four injured or was it four killed? I think you said the number was three, but regardless, is it the number of people that were injured or is it the number of people that were killed? Uh, that 309 was the number of people killed. So, and then, so to be clarified, to be um, considered a mass shooting, is it that three or more people have to be killed or injured? Uh, killed, murdered. Killed. It, yes. And then it's three, is that correct? Three or more, yes. Great. So thank you for clarifying. Yeah, whoever asked, asked that question, good question. Yeah, murder. So looking at things on the public health side, uh, we have different layers uh, that we can deal with um, this complex issue. Um, but today, for the purpose of time, we're just going to focus on the community layer. 
uh, looking at life expectancy. I mentioned that in our pre and in my previous slide. Uh, looking at injuries, uh, mortality, and you look at mo mo uh, mobil mobility too. Um, we just talked about heart disease. We just talked about cancer. Uh, they're having these chronic issues uh, that leads to physical effects on, on the body. And on an individual level, looking at the physical effect and the psychological effects. Uh, this, uh, this model helps us organize and conceptualize potential determinants uh, of uh, the behavior. So looking at the psychological effect, we, we heard this a lot, you know, in ACES, you know, it's, a, it's been significant research that uh, provide linkage between youth homicides and injuries from firearms. Now, there are still more things to be done around this, uh, this topic uh, when it comes to the psychological effects. So if you're on this line and, you, and you're in this line of research, please, you know, continue to do the, re the research. Now I charge anyone that's in the industry of schools, community-based organizations, parents that's on the line, our stakeholders, you must understand that traumatic effects and impacts from gun violence for our children may not be necessarily correlated with a direct impact, but simply hearing and seeing an incident within their neighborhood also has an impact on them, okay? Again, not direct experiences, but just seeing and hearing if you just heard, and you're in school, you just heard that your, your uh, classmate just passed from a gun violence incident that happened two blocks from you. You wasn't there. You had no idea um, what happened. And you get that news at age 10. That has an effect on them, a psychological effect. They, they're, they're not able to conceptualize the same things that we can at this, um, at this age. We talked about chronic issues. Now, I am not an MD, but I did some preliminary research on some, some of the physical effects uh, that, that uh, trauma from gun violence has on an indi individual. So if you look at the seroton uh, serotonin and dopamine levels, uh, so serotonin is an important chemical within our bodies that help us regulate our moods, our social behaviors, our appetites and digestive system, our sleep, our memories, um, that's, that's important to understand. Um, when serotonin and dopamine levels, uh, not, when they're not functioning like they're supposed to, it's difficult to cope with difficult situations. It makes it very, very difficult to cope, you know, and excel in positive endeavors. So 90% of our serotonin, it comes from our GI tract. That's why you get that gut feeling. Now I want us to uh, look, at, look at that really closely uh, because if a, a student, a, a young person, even us as adults, as we're suffering from PTSD from these incidents, that's having a, a really lasting chronic issue with our bodies, you know, that's affecting our behaviors, our appetites, our sleep, our memory. Kids are not focusing in school, right? We're not focusing at our, at our jobs. We're not sleeping well. That has a physical impact that leads to morbidity issues. Right, we looked at uh, amongst black males, they're having heart disease issues later on in life because they're not getting. It may not be directly affected by the trauma, but if they're not getting sleep and not eating right, and we had we talked about well, well, you should know about food deserts within these neighborhoods, and they're not they're, they're eating crap that's in our neighborhoods, that's having a lasting effects uh, effect on their physical behavior. So I have to take a, phys uh, a public uh, health approach to this incident, to these incidents. Um, so the role of public health officials, we have to address things on a uh, systematic level by collecting data, um, looking at the scope of violence on a, both the local levels, uh, the national levels and international levels. We can pull some good information um, on all three levels. Uh, we have to implement promising interventions, determine the cost, because you have to look at the money, right? And then widely disseminate information. I, I really want to talk about that real quick. Disse disseminating information. So one of the things in public health and other professions, uh, sometimes we have a rigid approach because we have resources, everything's research-based, you have to get the grants to get the funding and uh, everything is rigid. Um, we have to understand that Disseminating information, it takes it. We can learn a lot from our corporate partners uh, when it comes to 
the me engaging with the media, engaging with uh, marketing strategies, engaging with uh, dissemination strategies, mass media uh, outlets. Uh, sometimes we just don't do that. We just don't have the funding. So anybody that's that's in, in this space, uh, just really uh, consider that. We have to explore um, violence prevention. Uh, we have a lot of uh, community health workers that's out there doing the work that's on the ground right now. Our violence interrupters, I applaud them who are doing the work on the ground right now. That's some of the ways that we can support the public health efforts. And then we have to investigate why violence occurs, our root causes including the factors that may be modifiable, right? Uh, just talked about, uh, we have to be fluid. You know, it's something to call uh, developmental evaluation. You know, we try, to, we try to evaluate things on the fly as, as things change. So everyone that's in this space right now, you're either my age, a little bit below my age, or you may be uh, a little bit older than me, right? Um, but you may, and you may be a parent. So, Talking about modifiable, we have to focus on our youth. Our youth, they're going to bring that innovative approaches to this to these things, you know, because they're they're dealing with these incidents firsthand. They are our future. They're dealing with things differently. They're socially engaging differently. They're coping differently. They're experiencing society differently than us uh, back when we was in school. They have social media, which is a huge factor. I wanna talk about some of the research I recently was engaged with, with the Chicago Gun Violence Research Collaborative. Uh, we uh, engaged our youth by, um, we titled our, our case study, uh, Research Activism Through the Youth Voice. This helped uh, us uh, evaluate, excuse me, uh, elevate youth voice by directly engaging them and in, in the research itself, in the implementation process by supporting their efforts to promote health equity related to gun violence. And it was very interesting. Um, we helped them uh, leverage community-based research and stimulate community action by looking at policy that addresses the root causes uh, of health. There was about 25 youth within the Roseland community. We worked with an uh, organization called Kids Off the Block. Um, they, was, uh, they ranged between the ages of 14 and 24, and they was 100% uh, males, uh, excuse me, 100% Black and African American. Some of the result, uh, some of the things that we did with this uh, collaborative, uh, we helped them brainstorm some uh, concerns that they had within the community as it relates to gun violence. Uh, the mentors and the students, they turned their concerns into a 55 item survey, and then the youth completed that survey. These are the, you know, we, well, we had 55 um, results generated. We took top 20, but I'm just, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm displaying the, the top 10. Just take a look at that for a second. For my folks in the public health space, looking at these themes and these results, does it remind you of anything? If it does, put it in the chat, please. If you put the social determinants of uh, public health, you're absolutely right. Uh, looking at these themes, uh, you can tell that these youth, and they, we didn't come up with this, uh, these issues, you know, we, the, the youth did. So if you look at these themes, um, they talk about economic stability. They talked about the neighborhood and built environments. They talked about the social, and community context. Uh, they talked about access to healthcare and the quality of the healthcare. I really wanna focus on the last two, nine and 10, the stress within the Roseland uh, community, um, mental health services that, was, uh, that they had access to. Mental health services is, is uh, something serious because if you think about root causes, uh, they need access to these resources. It's very important. Uh, we have to stay on top of, uh, of these issues. Why? Uh, because I, I just mentioned, they're dealing with things differently within the social media. Uh, you talk about cyber bullying, victimization, you know, uh, dating aggression, cyber stalking, cyber suicide. They're posting things online. They're putting their whole life online. Just look at their social media. 
uh, in gang violence, you see this. And that's one thing that we heard through our studies, not only this study, but a lot of other um, studies that I've done within Chicago, uh, gang violence on social media is serious. Uh, they um, put it in songs, they put it in so social media, they taunt on social media, and this leads to incidents that's on the street. We've seen that a lot, They've, and they feel pressure. So if you flaunt guns and you, you're taunting on social media, uh, someone, that, that person that's being victimized at that moment from, from cyberbullying, they feel pressure to do something about it because they just had 300 likes uh, from this incident. And now they feel like they have to retaliate. They feel the pressure to retaliate, and that leads to these issues that we have in the street, specifically here in Chicago. So let's you know, talk through some promising action-based interventions. So I, I mentioned social media, they're putting it all out there. Uh, we have to think about threat assessment, right? Um, threat assessment helps us identify leakage. Leakage is considered communication to a third party of a, uh, excuse me, a third party of an intent to do harm uh, to a target, right? I talked about ta taunting. A third party uh, uh, is typically other people uh, by the means of communications, and that could vary between spontaneous utterances, direct uh, taunting, on uh, social media, do other means of communication, uh, but I really wanna specifically focus on social media. Right now in Illinois, we have um, some, some promising laws in, in, on the books right now uh, with the, the School Safety Drill Act. Um, they're considered red flag laws, and you, see, you may see that in the social media. Um, Joe, uh, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, just passed the Bipartisan Safer uh, Communities Act. Uh, it's considered a red flag law. Uh, the Firearms Restraining Order Act here in Illinois is considered a red flag law. And, and these laws help us, you know, uh, petition um, petition to the courts to remove the weapons from people deemed a threat to themselves or others. So it's not the government, it's not law enforcement, it's not police that's, you know, it's just going in petitioning uh, to the courts. It can be you. If you see um, someone posting on social media that they want to harm another person or harm themselves, you can petition to the courts to remove their weapons, right? Uh, I know people, the first thing that come to mind, you're infringing on my rights uh, to, to hold a gun. Uh, this is not about gun control. It's about casualty control. We just had an incident on the 4th of July. I just uh, explained incidents dating back uh, from 2008, and, and we can date back before that. Um, but we have to think about these, these incidents. One of the things in, the, in these red flag laws um, that just passed on a national level, uh, it helps us uh, prevent uh, convicted, not arrested, but convicted um, domestic violence abusers from owning a gun. Uh, and it includes the dating partner, not just from their spouses or, or former spouses. I know we think about spouses and former spouses, like somebody that's being married, but as we know, you can be married or you can be with someone for 15 years and never married, um, but you're still together. So that's considered a domestic partner. Uh, so it helps us deal with these issues. Just recently here around UIC, we responded to, um, on, on last Friday, we responded to a incident of a domestic violence um, issue that was going on and an officer was just shot. Uh, the, the guy just opened fire on officers and it all stemmed from domestic violence uh, issues. It expands the background checks uh, between the ages of 18 and 21 uh, from seeking a gun. Okay, it, that is very important. I really wanna emphasize that last point because it's, you know, when you talk about access to care and the quality of care, it should not be more accessible to purchase an AR-15, a Draco, a Glock 9, than it is to schedule an appointment with a health, mental health professional. I would say that again, it should not be more accessible to purchase a AR-15, a Draco, a Glock 9, than it is to schedule an appointment with a mental health professional. That's very important, okay? And when we talk about access to care, we talk, uh, we talk through Roseland's uh, community and the youth, they told us through that, through that qualitative data, they told us 
that they need more access to mental health professionals. So it takes a multi-layer layer approach. From our community residents, our community-based organization, our elected officials, our public safety officials, and then exterior partners. We have to leverage each other. You have to lean on each other. When we talk about when we talk through complex issues like gun violence, it's not one size fit all. This is a, a complex issue. We need all hands on deck when it comes to these issues. Uh, particularly around police is repurposing and revitalizing the roles of police so they can have an authentic community-based response. We, we're seeing that in Illinois with our uh, crisis intervention teams. Uh, we see them teaming up with mental health partners uh, to respond to mental health issues. Uh, we're seeing the trend going in that direction, but we need everybody to be on board when it comes to these issues and responding. So talking through some suggested solutions, we have to invest in our youth to help them overcome these ACEs and increase opportunity. What does that look like? Workforce development, you know, college readiness. Not everyone's ready to go to college though. We have to help them through that, creating those soft skills, looking to trade school readiness, providing them the opportunity to work for their families, right? that keeps them off the street. We, it's, been, it's been talked through, we talked about it a lot, um, but are we actually doing it? And then you have to understand the gun culture here, not only in America, but in Chicago. We talked through some of that with uh, some of the social media approaches. Uh, we, have to, we have to understand the culture of the gun violence and the psychological aspect um, behind the violence itself. Then we have to build the community capacity and foster, foster communication amongst each other. One thing we see is everyone has a nonprofit. Everyone has, you know, doing something. They're trying to do something, but are we united and, and, and um, providing and fostering communication amongst each other to provide some logical approaches to uh, gun violence? Then we have to support and empower our community. Like I said, nationwide, a lot of communities are dealing with these root, cause, root causes, uh, these uh, social uh, impacts, uh, the social determinants of public health. Uh, they're dealing with structural violence, systemic issues. Uh, so we have to understand from a community level how we need to approach these issues. And then move forward by seeking the missing voices. And that's the youth. They are the missing voices. They're the next, the next generation. Uh, to these uh, to resolve these issues, we have to understand that and get them engaged in that conversation. You cannot be extractive. You have to come into these communities and understand that our youth is our next generation and what they're going through, both physically, psychologically. You know, um, at school, outside of school, uh, they are they know what's really going on and they can provide some critical information to our research. They can provide some critical information uh, to some solutions. I really appreciate everyone's uh, time and for logging into this session. Um, I wanna open it up for questions. Karen, do we have any questions? Yes, Terry, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, the entire framework of this conversation and just providing data and research for us and just helping us process and try and understand and some potential solutions. Uh, a couple of questions have come in. Uh, somebody had said, um, you've talked about the ACE, the survey, um, and somebody in chat, I guess, has been helpful also trying to help define it. But could you actually define what the ACE, what, what ACE is? Yeah, a, 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 excuse me, a verse. Um, give me one second. I want to go back to that slide. It really defines it. No, thank you. There's just been so much good information. Yeah. I think that was just to dig in a little bit more to understand. Yeah, uh, adverse childhood experiences. Problem. Yeah, adverse childhood experiences. Um, so anyone that's impacted by trauma, um, uh, they are they're dealing with these experiences from trauma. You know, so you know when you talk talk about ACEs, they they're lasting effects on the individual um, that that deal with these traumatic issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question came in and I'm gonna take the liberty to see if we can do this as almost a two part. So the question is, 
Mass shootings get a lot of media attention, but is the average citizen more at risk from everyday gunfire or mass shootings? I, that's a very global question. So I wonder if it's it's across the United States and then also maybe Chicago, Chicago land. I don't know if there's a, a way to break that down or not. Can you repeat that question? I'm sorry. Yes, no, of course. Uh, mass shootings get a lot of media attention. Mm -hmm. Is the average citizen more at risk from everyday gunfire or mass shootings? I want to say the everyday citizen is more at risk. Um, no one's immune from, from these uh, incidents. Uh, mass shooting can happen anywhere. Um, it can happen within uh, neighborhoods that, uh, that have these, these issues. Um, it can happen in um, neighborhoods and communities that really have a low uh, crime rate. Um, it all depends on uh, the community itself to actually catch these, uh, the, the, the leakage you know, from, from social media, from utterances, from conversations, uh, talking to our kids, talking, talking through uh, these issues. Now, I, I do wanna, I do wanna talk about one thing uh, on a community level. We talked about threat assessment. We can provide community threat assessment teams. Um, it's mandated on a school level and a higher education level uh, to have threat assessment teams, but are we thinking about threat assessments on a community level so, so we can identify individuals? Um, red flag laws is one of them. It helps us petition to the courts. Uh, if you feel like someone is a harm to themselves or others, um, you can petition to the court to have their weapons removed, right? At least it go through due process to at least evaluate that individual to see if they're harm or risk to the community. What I'm hearing you say is reminding me of the whole, if you see something, say something, and that people Absolutely. really need to take individual responsibility to, to just be aware and be aware of what they may or may not be seeing and what those messages could be sending. Um, I have a secondary question to this which is I had, what can, what can an individual do? So I had read an article at one point that said you should always have your escape route. You should always have your plan if you're going to an event, a, a big crowded venue of, or sorts. Mm -hmm. um, are, there, are there tips that you have of what individuals can do? Uh, because I don't believe people should live their, live their lives in fear and you wanna go out yes. and do some things. And so how do you, how do you manage that? Well, um, it's gonna be a level of anxiety uh, considering that we, we are dealing with these issues nonstop. Um, however, it is always good to be hyper aware of your surroundings. Um, we see a lot of these uh, incidents uh, occur in different spaces. Uh, you have to just be hyper aware, uh, make sure we know, like you said, where, where the exits are, how to best get out the situation. Um, if you see anything suspicious, just report it. Uh, you see anything that looks out of the ordinary, report it. Um, and a lot of people, they feel triggered by reporting things to, to law enforcement or police um, because they don't want uh, it to have a negative impact on that individual. But it's okay. That police are professionals. They're going to assess the situation first and then make a decision, right? You know, um, and if they're not managed correctly, it, it's repercussions to that, uh, to those issues. Thank you. Another question came in about would, would the new gun laws have helped prevent what happened in Highland Park, in your opinion? So Highland Park and other mass shooting issues, um, it would have helped. Would it, you know, preventing? We don't know. We have no idea. You know, you, it's a thin line between infringing on someone's constitutional rights and at least identifying a threat, right? Um, these gun laws help us identify the threat. Uh, it gives a person due process within the courts. Um, they, uh, a um, you know, judicial professional will look at that incident and look at that individual um, and, and due process, give them due process, look at the totality of the threat and make a decision if their weapons need to be taken away. This might be in line. Another question came in about if you could talk a little bit more about leakage. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, just looking at this Highland Park incident, um, the suspect, because um, he hasn't, he's been officially charged, but he hasn't had his day in court, right? But the suspect uh, um, that we have in custody now, uh, he posted several items on his social media. 
you know, indicating that he wanted to harm others, right? Uh, that's considered leakage. He, the incident didn't occur yet, but he advocated and, and uh, was infatuated by harming others. That's considered leakage. Uh, when you think about, you know, someone who loves guns, right? They love AR-15s, they love Glock 9s, they love, they love guns. That's not really considered leakage. You know, you could be a gun enthusiast and, and, love, and love weapons, but you'd be safe with it. But if you love guns and you're talking about harming someone else, we need to report that. You know, when you're thinking about, you know, threatening, you know, uh, posing threats to other people and, and harming someone else, that's considered the leakage. Thank you. I see we have a person who has their hand raised. We, we have, the way it's worked, I'm not sure we can turn mics on <laughs> the way the Zoom is set up. So if you don't mind just chatting and I'm happy to ask the question on your behalf, uh, just the way we have our Zoom set up. We don't always let mics come up, so I apologize for that. Um, but I'm happy to ask your question, so please go ahead and, and chat it. Uh, another question that came in is, what happens when red flag laws do not pick up on the threats in time? Mm -hmm. uh, meaning, in your opinion, do you think we can strengthen those red flag laws to prevent... Good question. Um, I think um, we're, again, it's a thin line between um, infringing on someone's constitutional rights and uh, at least identifying uh, the threat. Uh, so making it a little, you know, making laws more restrictive, I think we run into that, that, that issue of constitutional rights, right? Um, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult, it's a complex issue because again, it can get political. Uh, like I began at the beginning of this conversation, um, it, can, it can get real political and this is not a political conversation. Um, what, I, what I can say is uh, we do have laws on the books. You do have power as individuals, as community, as, as a community to um, identify a person, report the person and put them through a process where um, you know, we can uh, you know, intervene. Now, if you feel that, like that threat is imminent, then you need to go directly to the police department. Um, you can re report it to your superior so they can actually you know, report this incident so we can make you know, immediate, have an immediate response. And law enforcement do have the ability to um, determine if a person is a threat to themselves or others and then petition them uh, on a mental health level. Thank you. There was just a comment that I, um, would like to share with you, which was that the person wrote, I wish there was more openness to mental health support in the Black community, particularly among men, given the high rates of suicide and trauma exposure. I don't know if you're familiar with any work that might be ongoing there or that um, there's efforts. Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of uh, work and I commend uh, the community-based organizations that's actually doing the work. Uh, first, I want to um, you know, commend uh, the Chicago uh, gun violence research collaborative um, who are consistently working uh, with different partners to, to collaborate on mental health um, resources. Um, I'd like to collaborate uh, and uh, commend Imagining a What If, uh, who specialize in youth development uh, within the Inglewood community that helps uh, the youth um, connect with mental health services. And then, you know, Health and Wellness Inspired, um, they're collaborating with different community-based organizations uh, throughout Chicago and, and Illinois uh, to help them um, help different organizations provide mental health support. So there are individuals and organizations that's out there today, right now, doing the work, specifically violence interrupters, specifically community health workers. That actually leads to, we had some questions about violence interrupter programs. Have you found any particular model successful or, or um, any comments around those types of programs? You know, it's a, it's a lot of research around uh, community health um, workers and violence interrupters. Um, it, it's it's a, quite a few. I, I don't want to leave out anyone, so I'm not going to name uh, any organizations, uh, but I, I have worked with violence interrupters in, in the past. And um, just looking at Cure Violence, you know, they, they've almost started uh, the, the conversation around violence and gun violence being a disease and it can pa be passed on through generation. Uh, we talked about structural violence uh, in the presentation and how structural violence is set up um, within our communities being victimized 
uh, you can date it all the way back to slavery, how trauma was passed down and having you know, these adverse effects. Uh, we talked about the AIDS, the adverse childhood effects and they pass on to their children and that pass on to their children. If you think about a disease, it gets passed on. We, we looked at COVID, it's being passed on within six feet. So if you look at that pass on effect, looking at gun violence as a disease being passed on and passed on and passed on, uh, what do you do when you have a disease? You look at that cause, look at the root causes. We talked about the pillars of public health. Uh, those are the root causes of these uh, gun violence uh, incidents. So we have to address the root causes first. And that's one thing that we know, Karen, that we could talk about gun, uh, root causes all day. We know what the root causes are. I charge everyone that's listening right now to do something about it, get engaged. You know, it's a lot of organizations that's providing these resources to address these root causes versus sitting on Zoom, I, we need folks to get out there, to be to get involved. Thank you, and what a different way to approach that conversation too, to talk about the root cause and to talk about it as a disease and, and how we prevent that, right? I mean, your, your, your example to compare to COVID, look at all the efforts to try and get immunizations and to do things differently. So how, how do we organize? I think that's, that's really a, an excellent point. Uh, another question that came in, how can we do some real prevention for early youth even when the parents are hard to reach? For example, what could we mm. have done in Highland, excuse me, for example, what could we have done for the Highland Park, Park suspect when he allegedly attempted suicide in 2019? Well, to, to, for the first part of that question, um, outside of Highland Park, you know, it, we had to get the youth involved in different opportunities to get exposed to these resources. You know, so you've, you've heard this a lot, you know, we, we're providing safe spaces for you. We're providing that safe space, you know, that keep them off the streets, you know, they're playing basketball, they're playing football, they're involved in sports, safe space. But it takes a little bit more than just providing the safe space. We have to provide the resources. So we have to reach them where they are, right? You know, again, we talked about social media, them being the next generation of, uh, next generation of leaders. So while we're in that safe space with them, uh, we have to provide resources there. You know, if they're not coming to that safe space, community health workers, violent in interrupters, they're meeting them where they are. If the parent is absent, their parent's not there, we're meeting them where they are. And, and in the case of Highland Park, you know, someone seen, you know, these postings. Someone heard, um, you know, this, this, this language. You know, and just using that as an example, right? Because we have different, you know, incidents where we've seen that leakage or uh, uh, dialogue around causing some type of harm to someone else. If you hear it, please just report it. You know, that's that's it. It's, it's, and it triggers, you know, a response. And it could not, I mean, sometimes it don't have to be a police response. Oh, we're just going to go and lock them up. That's not always the response. We can, he may just, he or she, may need to just talk to a mental health professional. Yeah, and, and to your point of just getting to people and just getting those resources and making that available and um, in a safe environment where people feel, where they feel comfortable having those conversations and um, the stereotypes around mental health have changed, I think, but they're still, they're still very real in, in many, many places. And so um, having those, so many important conversations here. And Karen, um, you know, yeah, the conversation has changed. I just want to interject. Um, you know, it is a stigmatism attached to mental health, especially within the black and brown communities. Uh, but you have um, organizations like, you know, Health and Wellness Inspired that's, that's looking at the conversation and the dialogue uh, and changing that dynamic, you know, changing how we view things and making it okay. And it's just, it's okay to talk through our issues. It's okay to be open. You know, if you hear, you know, you're in a group and you hear others that's going through the same issues that you're going through, um, that helps. And, and we're providing those resources. So um, I applaud every organization that's out there, at least taking that approach. Yeah. And, and I do hope the conversation is changing and we can, we can address some of those stigmas because it is, um, it's just so needed. Um, Mental health is just like the rest of your health. You know, every part of you needs to be, um, you know, have assistance. Um, 
I think really, so I've, I've seen a couple of questions that are kind of all centering around the same thing about what should the next steps be for each person on this call? And I heard you say, get out and work in the community. So what are, what are some actionable things that you would recommend when you mm -hmm. leave the Zoom and it's like, what can I, because I, that's a feeling that I've heard from lots of people. What can I actually do? Um, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, so not everyone, not everyone's uh, equipped to work in the community, right? Uh, you may be an epidemiologist that study data. Um, and so providing that, that critical research to people that's out there uh, providing uh, resources and uh, they need that, not only that qualitative, but quantitative data uh, to, to provide, um, you know, to provide funding for a different project. Uh, so on, we talked about the social ecological approach, you know, you can look at policies uh, down, all the way down to the individual. Uh, just look at the different layers where you can just, you know, pitch into the conversation uh, where you can uh, provide some type of asset um, to this issue. So where, what, whatever you're good at, whatever you have your skills in, whatever you can provide an organization um, that's actually doing the work, that's how you can actually engage in this, in this work. It's a complex issue. It's complex. A lot, and we always try to look for one size fit all, but that's not the case. I'm sorry, it's not the case. Um, we, we have to look at it a multidisciplinary uh, approach. I think that's an extremely important point because you're right. We want to have a one, we want to have one solution, right? We want to be able to say, here's how we're going to change this and make it better. But it is very complex. And um, if I may add, I think it's also being educated about it and understanding those those resources to go to. We had another session on um, misinformation on COVID and social media and just was yes. sort of coming out and, and our faculty member at the time said, you know, you got to go to the CDC and you got to look at local. Don't even look at what's happening in the country. Look yes. at what's happening in your neighborhoods um, and be educated about um, what's happening in that case with the numbers around COVID. And, and this feels similar to me about understanding what resources and local things are there and what exists in your community and what you can do. Because um, you're right, not everybody is a community organizer or, or willing to do that or is able to do that for whatever reason. And so trying to figure out how you can, and, and maybe it's calling your, your political, your elected officials and yeah. being aware of the numbers and saying, here's what I'm aware of. How do we get more? Here's the mental health services available in my community. How do we get more? You know, whatever those different levels are, but taking some sort of action. Health literacy, you know, health promotion, um, health research, you know, all, all that it, it addresses uh, this issue, you know, if you look at it uh, on a systemic level, uh, we have to address things in different layers. It's, it's very important. Yeah, well, Terry, thank you so very much. As you mentioned at the beginning, we really had initiated this conversation after the tragedy in Texas, and, and who knew, um, you know, where we would be again so quickly. And um, but it is a, an, an endemic, and, and how we're addressing it. Thank you for this wonderful discussion today, and for providing. A space for us to have this conversation and, and to talk about um, information around it and what we can and cannot do. And so thank you very much for all your important work and just for your service, um, you know, in, in your roles in the community and also at UIC. We're very, very grateful for you and grateful that you are an alumnus, of course, of our yes. wonderful university. Yeah. So thank you. No, no, thank you to UIC and the School of Public Health uh, for uh, providing the space. Well, thank you again. Um, and just to quickly close this out, uh, please join us next Thursday on July 14th at noon central time for our next alumni exchange program. This is completely different than what we've been discussing today. Um, if you've ever wondered how you might be able to make money in the real estate market, but you weren't sure how, this may be a program for you to tune into. Join us as our two-time alumna, Julia Wesley, discusses how to build wealth by taking small steps and build a team of partners as she pre presents building wealth through real estate. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, but I want to mention again, especially for people that this is a lot of information to try and process. We uh, do have a recording of this, which will be available on our website, along with all of our past episodes. Um, and please be on the lookout for that survey that I mentioned at the beginning. We do valuable, we do value your time and opinions. Uh, so please do take that survey. Thank you again so much, Terry. We're so grateful for you um, and for all of your time in this wonderful conversation today and the work that you are doing. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us for the UIC Alumni Exchange. We look forward to seeing you in a future Alumni Exchange series. Thanks again and have a great day. Thank you.